Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Italian American Digital Projects interview series. Uh, we're here today with Professor Fred Gardefe, who uh, directs the Italian American Studies program at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. He is associate editor of Franoi, an Italian American monthly newspaper, editor of the series in Italian American Studies at the State University New York Press, and co-founding co-editor of VIA, Voices in Italian Americana, a literary journal and cultural review. Mr. Gardefe, uh, do you believe that Italian American culture can be used as a broader analytical framework to understand the United States and the American society? Yes, I think it begins a way to examine what happens when a culture from Europe comes into the United States and becomes American. And so when I teach Italian American studies, I always design my courses around that idea that we can learn about American history. In fact, it fulfills, at Stony Brook, it fulfills the uh, general education requirement for American pluralism for studying Italian American culture. So right, I think it can definitely work its way into uh, a way of understanding all of American culture. Now, what about the relationship between the second and the third generations of Italian Americans with Italy? I'm asking you this question because during a party in New Jersey, I uh, was shocked when um, they asked me if we had cell phones in Italy, and that <laughs> clearly means that they haven't been <laughs> to Italy in the last 10 years, or that they don't have so many connections with their right. own country. Um, Depends on what you mean by the second and third generation. There is certainly a, uh, I am a third generation Italian American. My grandfather immigrated from Italy in the 1920s. My idea of Italy came from my grandfather's uh, stories that he told me. When I went to Italy, I was surprised to see television antennas because he never described the sky as being filled with television antennas. And so my parents who had never been to Italy only had that image of what he gave them of Italy in their mind. So I broke that. So it, it, the way my grandfather became an American by coming to the United States, I became Italian-American mostly by going back to Italy. So we, we d there's many things we don't know. Are there internet connections in Italy? Uh, do Italians have Diet Coke? Uh, these are the things that, that young people today are beginning to, to find out. Uh, and so I, I really think it's important for us to travel back to Italy uh, to kind of reconnect uh, with the sense of, and, and redefine what it means to be Italian-American. Do you agree with Edvige Junta when she says that Italian-American authors write with an accent? Uh, I think every author writes with, with an accent, uh, but specifically Italian-Americans um, writes with a what we would call a unique Italian American accent although within Italian America it can mean many things Pietro Di Donato for example wrote with a very strong almost literal translation of Italian into English my English quite often is uh, uh, punctuated uh, with Italian melody uh, as opposed to English melody uh, especially when my grandparents would speak broken English so I do, think, I do think there is a distinct accent. And if you do not understand the various uh, dialects of Italy, uh, you probably would mistake it for uh, being an ignorant American. Uh, Mr. Gardner, can you explain to us the play on words you use in the title of your book, uh, Dago's Red, Tradition and the Italian-American Writer? Yes, that's uh, something that I paid a heavy price for uh, with really? the Italian community because wow. uh, because they didn't understand the irony behind it. And the first chapter of the book yeah. uh, explains why I use the word Dago in my book. Um, when I was a kid, Dago Red was a wine. I mean, we, you know, it was, right. it's, it's, a, it's an Italian wine. John Fonte wrote a collection of short stories called Dago Red. Uh, it never got reprinted as Dago Red. Red. Uh, it was called The Wine of Youth. I think somebody didn't want to use it. I actually read it as Dago Red. Oh, you did? I okay, did. you have a copy. I, I had a copy. Uh, Find a, a copy. It's, copy. W it's worth money. Is it? Uh, wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and so I wanted to echo that. But I also wanted to play around with this word Dago because Dick Gregory, the African American uh, activist and comedian, wrote a book called Nigger, and he said every time somebody uses that word, they're going to advertise my book. And I, I began to see that what we need to do, and this was in the 1970s, 60s. Um, and I began to see that we have to take control of that language. We have to take on the stereotypes, and we have to shake them out for what they are. 
and we have to get beyond them. The word Dago doesn't mean to me what it meant to my grandparents. It, it means something different. And so I thought by, by saying, look, it's, it, it echoes the word Dago's red, Dago red sign, uh, wine, but it also says Dago's, if you're going to call us Dago's, look, we do read. And this is what happens when a Dago reads, uh, you know, and, and this was you know, the whole book of uh, essays on Italian-American writers. So there's this kind of multi-play, which the second generation, the children of the immigrants, uh, took very personally and felt it was a way of, of uh, attacking my own culture. Uh, your book, From Wise Guys to Wise Men, explores the figure of the gangster in its social function in the construction of the Italian-American masculinity in the United States. Uh, why did you decide to analyze this, this figure, both in real life and in fiction, in connection to the Italian-American heritage? Well, first of all, I grew up around this image of, of the gangster, uh, as many Italian-American boys. Chaz Palminteri wrote a play about it, uh, The Bronx Tale. Uh, uh, Martin Scorsese grew up around it in his early films. And what I felt was that in all the other cases, they, they pretty much dramatized it without analyzing it, the image of the gangster. And so I decided I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, everybody kept either protesting the, the gangster or, or imitating the gangster. And I said, nobody understands what's going on here. So I wanted to use this particular study to analyze the impact that Italian masculinity had when it met American masculinity. And the perfect site to do this is a site that everybody's familiar with, which is the gangster. And so I looked at, I studied the history of Italian masculinity and American masculinity and uh, used this figure of the gangster as a way of uh, really doing what I think is a, is a kind of a site analysis of Italian American culture through this figure. Mr. Gardefet, would you explain how, in your opinion, mothers uh, mold Italian-American masculinity? Sure. I, I think that, in many respects, uh, the most unexplored relationship in Italian-American culture has been the mother-son. Uh, not that the mother-daughter or the father-daughter or the father-son. Uh, America is a pretty father-son oriented society. I uh, look at all the early literature. I mean, there's not too many m mothers who make an in, in important uh, impact in American society. Although mothers do, they are not accorded that kind of attention. Um, and what I find, uh, having grown up as an Italian-American boy, hanging around with Italian-American other boys and as we become men, is that in Italian culture, the mother is something that is, is revered from the time you're born all the way up. We don't, we don't make fun of our mothers. We can laugh with them, but we don't laugh at them. Uh, not in the same way that, say, in an African-American culture, where two guys will, will make fun of each other's mother. Your mother wears combat boots. Well, you don't even say the word your mother to an Italian-American guy joking around because it immediately would start a fight. And so there's this mother-son relationship, I believe, where the mother creates the most loyal person in the world, which is her son. And in order to get that loyalty, she will let him abuse her in ways she will let no other men abuse them. That's kind of putting it shortly. There's a lot more to it. It's very interesting. Can you explain to us the evolution of the image of the Italian-American gangster from Don Vito Corleone to Tony Soprano? Um, I think what we have is, is the, the metaphor that I use uh, in my book is from wise guys to wise men. Uh, Don Vito Corleone, very few people realize, was based on uh, the, the, uh, Don uh, uh, Mario Puzo's mother. Um, he, didn't, he never knew a gangster. Uh, he based that kind of power of uh, manipulating people, the power of protecting the family, uh, that Don Corleone has, he based it on his mother. And it's there in his first novel, The Fortunate Pilgrim, which is about a mother's son. The book didn't make any money. It was a critical success. It didn't get him the attention he wanted. And so he transformed that mother-son relationship into the father-son relationship in The Godfather. Now, what you have from, uh, from then on is this incredible imitation. It's this constant imitation of Don Vito Corleone or Michael Corleone or Sonny Corleone uh, throughout all the gangster films that follow uh, uh, there until you get to The Sopranos. Now, as much as 
uh, David Chase loves the, the film work of Coppola and Scorsese and honors them and even the earlier gangster films, he begins to examine this mother-son relationship. So you have this evolution of these wise guys into wise men. I would say even, even though we love Don Vito Corleone, uh, he's, he's still a wise guy. Uh, wise guys uh, tend to use uh, violence before thinking. Uh, violence seems to be the way that they move away from uh, logic and, and towards a when they have to create some action. So we find that happening uh, more so uh, in the earlier images than in the later ones. So that's why I think we're moving from the wise guy to the wise man.